Center, a very warm welcome to our JITEX virtual webinar series, powered by Lenovo. My name is Oscar Wendell, and I work with JITEX Technology Week, taking place at Dubai World Trade Center from Dubai from December 6th to 10th. Today's discussion is enabling intelligent transformation in a data-driven world. We have an impressive lineup of speakers joining us from around the globe, all leaders and pioneers in digital transformation. I want to thank you all for joining us today and a special thank you to Dave Crane, who will be moderating the discussion. Dave is a veteran of stage and corporate events. He was the host of Dubai Rugby Sevens for 20 years and has worked with stars like Bruce Willis, James Brown, and Sylvester Stallone. Dave hosts a live web show on changing your business in the current situation and will be launching a new web series later this month called Speak on Stage. I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I hope you all will join us in person at JITEX later this year. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I hand you over to you now, Dave Crane. Thank you, Oscar. Um, hello to everybody. It's been a complete pleasure to be here and to share this time with you. Thank you for taking the time to join us on this broadcast all about enabling intelligent transformation in a data-driven world. This is another JITEX virtual webinar powered by Lenovo. And uh, over the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna be lifting the lid on 5G, data centers, cloud computing, and the way that business will be more agile over the next few years. And for many people who are just thinking about emerging from a lockdown, if you haven't done it already, then you ought to be thinking about what do I do with my business and how can digital make a huge difference? Now, one of the things we're looking forward to is your questions. And throughout this entire event, we welcome you to send your questions to us. And when we get the opportunity, we will be sharing it with our esteemed panel. And if you're wondering how to do that, when you see the Q and A area on the bottom of your Zoom, you can go to the chat area there and we will be looking for your questions to share later on. Now we have an incredible panel who can be sharing insights from all the elements of the industry and some of the biggest players, not in the region, but worldwide. To give you an example of that, we're covering the full ecosystem of digital delivery and transformation. So from hardware, we've got Lenovo, from software and cloud services, we're bringing you Microsoft, from project management and strategy and transformation, uh, Digital 14, uh, and data transfer and providing the 5G networks from STC. Now, it's great to see that we've got over a thousand people who have registered and are joining us from across the world. Really wonderful to have you here, and I hope you enjoy our discussion as it continues. So with that, I'd like to um, start with our keynote presentation and introduce to you uh, Dr. Chris Cooper uh, from Lenovo. And Chris, it's good to see you, looking very serious, but you're looking very good, I've got to say, better than me. I should get a backdrop just like that. Um, you're gonna be sharing a ton of content with us to give us an introduction to this whole project, enabling intelligent transformation in a data-driven world. Now, before we actually start, when the whole thing is about becoming um, data-centered and not working with data centers. What does that mean? So Dave, thanks very much for that. Really, I just need all of us to think carefully about how transformations are impacted. So it's not just about shifting of technologies, it's using new technologies and changing mindsets. So if you think about what's happening in the world, all new connected devices, huge volumes of data, it's now about how we get data-centered rather than just the traditional approach which has been data centers and cloud. So it really is about how do we connect to all those new data volumes that are coming in. Excellent. Well, you're going to be delivering your keynote speech in a few moments time, and that should hopefully give food for thought for many of our people who are watching and wondering how they actually jump in to the new technology and how they address it and how they can take advantage of it to run their business. And then we'll go into our panel after that. So I'd like to hand over to you, Chris, uh, to share your wonderful presentation. And after that, we're gonna have a poll. So make sure you stand by. It's gonna last for about 10 seconds. Uh, and we're gonna be asking you a very simple question, which I'll tell you now, what are the main challenges you foresee in implementing such data-driven transformations in the era of edge and 5G technologies? That's the question. It's gonna make a lot more sense after we listen to and see um, the information that's going to be shared uh, with Dr. Chris Cooper from Lenovo. Thanks very much, Dave. And again, a very warm welcome to all of you. It's great having you here. And again, a massive thank you to our esteemed colleagues here on the panel as well. Great to get such strong SMEs on such a discussion. And I'm hoping it'll be quite informative for all of you, and we will take it off here. So again, so we're starting with the title of Enabling the Intelligent Transformation in a Data-Driven World. Now, digital trans transformations are accelerating. They're accelerating at a very fast pace. We've only got to look at what's happened in recent months, specifically around 
the result of the pandemic. We've seen an explosion of data transformation. And the huge focus of that has been placed on equipping employees for remote working. Okay, so as an example, uh, back in April, Microsoft Teams, they saw 200 million meeting participants in one single day. Now, apologies to Microsoft that we're actually running this on Zoom, but again, that generated more than 4.1 billion meeting minutes. Okay, now as we actually look at what's behind driving the enablement of intelligent transformation, we need to address these two things. One is the abundance of new data that's being generated out there in the marketplace. And that's coming in from the huge volumes of newly connected devices. And this is prevalent across all industries. So as mobile devices and internet connected products proliferate, data is growing both in, in volume, but also in velocity. And that's important to understand. IDC predict that by 2025, there'll be approximately 80 billion devices connected to the internet. I mean, that's just immense. So as we move on to the next chart, what I want us to focus on here is as we discussed earlier and Dave brought up, we need to, to accommodate this, we need to look beyond the traditional data center, beyond cloud. And we need to focus on data centered. And I'll repeat that again, data centered. We need to take advantage of the huge volumes of data that are being generated by all these new connected devices and being generated in new ways and extract the information that comes from that. Now on the chart here on the left, there's a quotation here um, that is it's somewhat dated, but it's from Forrester, but it's, it's still prevalent. There's a huge volume of data that's being generated that's still currently unused, and that needs to be addressed. The other thing to note is, even though the edge focus is growing away from the traditional data centers and cloud, there is still growth in cloud. There's still growth in the traditional data center business. But as it stands today, the stats say that 10% of enterprise generated data is both created and processed outside of the traditional centralized data center or cloud. But Gartner believe by, nine, by 2025, that number will increase from 10% to 75 percent it's immense now again think about this one of the biggest concerns as we move towards edge and iot is security you're now moving traditional infrastructure that's been seen in a, a stronghold of a data center and moving it to the edge where it's visible people can see it so big concern there on security and again you know if you look at the predictions at the moment we're looking at the cost of ransomware alone, and we're all aware of this in the marketplace, reaching $6 trillion by 2021, okay? So again, as we move then, the key thing here is about unlocking the value of this intelligent transformation. Why do it? The purpose behind doing this is really about delivering real impact on human lives. It's about being client-centric. And again, the stats are out there as a large number of companies have already embarked on their digital transformation. To date, unfortunately, 85% of those investments have actually been unsuccessful, but there's been a huge amount of learnings from that, and we need to share that best practice. But again, every industry here is impacted, and it's important we understand that, and understand that there's a huge benefit from deploying a successful digital transformation. And if truth be told, it's not just about the, the, the benefit. All organizations have to, from all walks of life, they have to embark on this journey. You know, the growing availability of data is just astounding. I mean, think of some simple practical examples. For years now, I've been using applications like Google Maps and Waze when I drive to my office, my place of work. Now you might think, surely by now you know where you work. And I'm sure each and every one of you do pretty much the same. But the truth is there's data and information out there that I can yield and benefit from that means that I can ensure I have an ETA of what time I'll get to my location. I can plan accordingly. It gives me information about congestion, closure, closures of roads and so on. Take that forward to today. There's huge amounts of new data available. I now use those applications, 
to go to a new store. It could be that I'm not sure that the direction's fine, but also I'm using it because it will give me my ETA and tell me whether that store is open when I get there. Additionally, even now, it will give hotspots, for example, of COVID-19, and we have to bring it back to the today. So there's huge amounts of information out there. And taking the example of COVID-19 and the pandemic, you know, this is a clear example of where digital transformations have already accelerated and there's such a necessity for this. We just have to look at the fast acceleration of VDI in our client base over the last few months. Look at the huge focus around healthcare, pharmaceuticals, and HPC and drug discovery. Looking at the new just drugs that are required to, to fix these ailments. Look at the HPC and AI modeling that's been done to monitor the potential spread of the pandemic and the potential implications. Truth be told, the promise of digital transformation, of enabling these evolving technologies, edge, IoT, and 5G, and the increased accessibility of smart, connected technology means that edge and IoT is actually both a lucrative and a necessary investment for all companies in all industry verticals. Now, granted, the adoption rates will vary depending on the industry. And what we're seeing is there's many more use cases coming to the market and those are being exploited. The good news is that the technology is now here to help us with that digital and intelligent transformation, unlike what's happened previously. The proliferation of these new technologies actually offers a tremendous opportunity, both to dramatically improve the existing processes, but also it creates new business models and new revenue streams for our customers and our partners alike. Now, one key vertical that's not covered here, and it's, it's not on purpose, is telco. But let's just think about this. Through a combination of network function virtualization and edge with 5G, it will transform this space and enable them to deliver completely different services to the industries. Now, this is one of the topics that I know that Saud on our panel will cover in respect to the telco operators. And I know that Ahmed from Microsoft has got some new exciting offerings that he'll probably mention as well. But again, underpinning all of this is the need for enhanced security solutions. And that's why we're pleased to have Nanesh here as well, joining us from Digital 14. So as we move to the next chart, again, this is really about how do we make this happen? Okay, on the next chart, please. How do we make this happen? This is not just about delivering new technologies. What's really important here is to understand there has to be a mindset change. We've learned from this previously. In the industry, as we've gone from three-tier architectures towards hyper-converged infrastructures, which combines the compute, the network, the storage, the applications in a tightly confined environment, takes away the challenges of latency and bandwidth. It wasn't just about driving new technology and a forklift change. It was actually about the change in mindset. Take an example of financial services, a customer we, work with, we actually work with. When a business wants to deploy a new service, because of all these silos, it was taking on average 41 days to get that new business operation for their customer. By deploying a hyper-converged approach, they brought that down to less than an hour, delighted their customer, less than an hour. But again, this is because it removed the necessity of a storage, a network, a compute admin, and so on. It removed those bottlenecks. But what it meant, it availed them to do new things and deliver new value for the organization. And again, it's about leveraging the fact that today in the marketplace, the technology is available. I think back to when 3G became available, what, 20 odd years ago. That really was a technology that was looking for a market. It was looking for the applications to drive it. Where here we have the technologies available, but it's the market that's driving it. Whether it's gaming technologies, whether it's the requirement of some of the smart verticals and artificial intelligence, there's a real requirement for 5G, Edge, and IoT. And the great news is we now have the technologies providing that. And again, this is about all of us taking a part here and understanding that we have to stay ahead of the curve. It doesn't matter what industry we're working, what industry we're working into and supplying and supporting. It's about helping our customers remain competitive. So a key note here, we are all responsible as we move to the final chart, okay? When you consider all the impacts of all of the above industries across all the use cases, 
we all have to do our bit around this intelligent transformation to provide for a better world. And I hope through the Q&A sessions, we can answer and address some of the burning questions that you have. So at this point, I'll hand back over to Dave. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. That would normally get a round of applause, but I'm sure we can have a digital one sent to you as we speak. Great presentation, really exciting to see that the innovative changes that are heading our way. And we're gonna give people an opportunity now to give their view as we invite them to take part in our viewers poll. Now the question will be coming up in a moment and we'll read it as soon as it does. And uh, you get about 10 seconds to give your view by ticking off the different elements that are there. It's gonna basically ask you what are the main challenges you foresee in implementing such data-driven transformations in the era of edge and 5G technologies. And there's a number of different options for you to be able to answer. First of all, the need for more specific technology education, that's A. B, clearer TCO analysis examples to justify the transition. C, key SI's partners to go to, to take care of it. D, all the above. Or E, if you think that you don't need anything and you've actually created a Star Trek ship yourself, then uh, we're fine and we're ready to go. We'd like to get your votes on that. Please feel free to press on the one that's most relevant to you and then we'll see the results. So if you'd just like to take your time, we've got enough for a few seconds to go through that main challenge to implement data-driven transformations using edge and 5G technologies. So give you a few more moments to take your vote. And then with that, we'll find out exactly what people are thinking. And a couple of questions that were coming in early, by the way, people are saying, uh, are you live? We are very live. We are broad we're broadcasting to you from right across the world. And uh, so we wouldn't do anything less. So there we go. Looking at the, the answers here, by far the need for more um, specific technology education. We thought that would be the case. Okay, so oh, actually all the above. Chris, what do you see when you see a poll like that coming in? By far, all the above, beyond all the other things. Well, I think all of the above really answers it, Dave, to be honest. Um, but let, let's just pinpoint on a couple of things. There's education required constantly. Every organization needs to be constantly transforming. As new technologies are evolving, we all have to be re-educating ourselves. So it's about being, being there first to market. As I said, transform or you get left behind. We have to move through this digital and then intelligent transformation, all organizations have to, or they'll get left behind. It's about remaining competitive in the marketplace. And it's one of our jobs to actually help educate the partners and our customers on how these new technologies and working closely with clients on their business issues, how we can help address some of those challenges. Excellent. Well, we're going to invite our panel to be able to put their thoughts together on this. You've already met Dr. Chris Cooper, a great, great presentation, whose main role is helping clients in their digital transformation journey so they work smarter with all the new and innovative emerging technologies. We'd like to also invite to open up the cameras uh, Saud Al Shahi, the GM for Business Development from STC, who leads digital transformation initiatives across different industries and specializes in solutions for 5G, AI, industrial, IoT, and blockchain. And if you're not sure what any of those mean, we'll be asking that question very soon. Also joined by Ahmed Al Hassab, who's the Intelligent Cloud Sales Leader for the MEA region from Microsoft and is part of Microsoft's team to empower organizations to achieve more with their digital transformations. Also joining us is Nilesh Patel, the Executive Vice President of Secure Solutions for Digital 14, who's beaming all the way from um, Silicon Valley. And I'm sure it's bedtime there, but thank you so much for joining us, Nilesh. Uh, your main role is driving the company's strategy, uh, uh, execution, and delivery of end-to-end -end cybersecurity products. And also your cloud services protect customers' devices, networks, data, and critical infrastructures. If you just joined us, then welcome to the broadcast. We've got a lot to get through. I'm gonna start off with a big question because for many people, this is the first thing they think of with 5G. Did 5G cause a coronavirus? Because my friend Bill said it did. I'm only joking, but there's some truth. that People are not sure what 5G is all about. It's got a bad press, but we know before all this happened, everyone was really excited about it. So. I'm going to throw it aside the first question. Why do we need 5G? And when I'm holding up my phone, which is 4G, what was wrong with that? It seemed fine to me five minutes ago. 
Thanks, Sam. David, for having me. And uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with your phone. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to 5G, I mean, uh, uh, 5G promises lots of things that are not available in the previous technologies, which is mainly uh, a bigger pipe if you need more data and you need faster internet and connection. It also promises low latency, and just like what uh, Dr. Chris mentioned for the ga gaming, it, it's a, uh, just a, a small example where you need a faster latency so you can have a better experience when it comes to gaming. And of course, uh, in addition to that, the uh, I would say the uh, security or the uh, I would say the multiple layers of uh, I would say campus networks that it has where you can, you may able to slice the network where we can jump also into a few examples on that uh, on a few seconds of the following questions. But in practical terms for the average person, what will change in their lives when they embrace 5G? What will it really mean to them rather than, oh, that's shiny? Well, it's, it's super fast. So if, if today, I mean, you, when you play uh, a game and you, if, if you see the gaming industry, for example, it's evolving very fast. So it, it's more of a ba more bandwidth hungry because you're, I mean, watching as an example uh, or playing a very, uh, I would say, heavy game on your phone. And with 5G, this will enable you to uh, play those games seamlessly and, and uh, without any interruptions or issues. The, as well, and in addition to that, I mean, the latency, so when you're playing with someone else, this, I mean, would, uh, would be more convenient for the players. So if we just jump away from the gaming, I mean, we can even take it to uh, healthcare industries, as an example, where, you know, uh, healthcare requires a huge bandwidth and data, for, for example, for the radiology piece, where you, you can take x-rays, MRIs, and you do all those remote surgeries even. And this is where 5G will enable those kind of applications and services. If we're taking the industrial piece as well, the 5G will enable uh, certain industries to automate and ma make machines talk to each other in a very fast manner. So believe it or not, I mean, if something is dropping, maybe the other machine will be able to pick it up uh, in a faster manner. And this is what latency means as an example. I understand. Now we're going to throw a question at everybody. And uh, your average person, your average business owner is really fascinated by the potential of what this new technology could give them. But there's a couple of questions they're going to have. First of all, the technology, where do I start? What do I, what do I invest in? Which organizations are going to give it to me? And how much is it going to cost? So can we have a look at the kind of technology that we should be thinking of as they start putting together their, st their strategy and their plan? Um, who wants to take this first? Nilesh, would you like to start with this? Yes, uh, thank you, Dave, and uh, glad to be here. Uh, some amazing, very interesting questions are coming up on the chat as well. So I look forward to uh, getting into that dialogue as well. But Dave, you just teed up a $6 trillion question. <laughs> no pressure said. then. <laughs> uh, no, seriously speaking, I think, um, you know, if you really think about uh, digital transformation um, and, and technology, more than technology, trust is the foundation of uh, any uh, digital transformation, in my opinion. Um, and so how do you really build trust in, in your digital transformation? And I believe that, you know, even if you have... Uh, amazing set of technologies, your trust in digital transformation will erode uh, if they are not intelligent, uh, not only intelligent, but also intrinsically secure. And in order to get there, you have to have a very clear security first approach in choosing your set of capabilities and solutions. Uh, first thing comes to mind is uh, secure by design. You wanna make sure that the products are chosen um, that are secure by design there are the product stack, the software stack is inherently secure. Nowadays, how many different hacking and breaches you hear about? Uh, you, the Twitter is fired up with uh, somebody collecting thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars from uh, uh, famous uh, uh, people, as you have just recently seen just yesterday. Uh, it wasn't so, me. You know, <laughs> yes, 
And so I think that the point is that there should not be no weak links in your product stack. I think if you talk about 5G and uh, very low latency uh, deployments in the field, autonomous cars, healthcare, everything, you need to make sure that the product is designed uh, with the secure by design. The second thing is as part of the total solution, you want to make sure that it's resilient end to end. You want to make sure that there are no attack surface that is unchecked. As particularly as you talk about edge, where data and applications are being delivered out of the edge and millions and billions of IOTs, suddenly your attack surface is very wide. So you need a continuous assessment of your environment. What you think is secure today does not mean it's gonna be secure tomorrow. So from your design practices, from your solution practices, you want resilient end to end. And finally, particularly in the more regulated verticals, government, uh, education, Maxim is one of the chat uh, question came in from Maxim about uh, education industry. Um, these are um, regulated industry and partly, particularly in the government sector, more and more the practitioners and solution providers and system integrators need to really keep in mind uh, the regulations that are coming in. More and more countries are looking for uh, uh, secure by design because of the geopolitical situation and so on the data that is secured and data security that used to be taken for granted is not anymore. And so a lot of governments want to control their own destiny, GDPR in Europe and every other in GCC countries, we are seeing a lot more regulation. So uh, standards will be important, secure and but sovereignty by choice. I'm going to interrupt you, important. Nilesh. I'm going to, I'm going to jump in because we're trying to keep the answers to about 90 seconds. And that was about 90 minutes. And I want to make sure that Very everyone good. gets a chance to say stuff, but some great Fantastic. stuff has come up there. Um, I'm going to throw this straight across at Ahmed, which um, it's not just about the technology. We've covered a fair chunk of it there, but here's a big problem. People have no clue about how to skill themselves and get up to point on all the new stuff and the new trends and new systems. Now, Microsoft has a pretty good history of getting people to understand what they need to be done, but how are you going to approach something like this? Uh, well, thanks, Dave, for, for such a good question. Uh, thanks all for all the panelists and being part of this uh, webinar today. So we've all witnessed, you know, the, the change across the technology moving from the 80s and 90s from the mainframe, the old era, and moving forward with the open standard systems, the dot-com buzz in the early 2000s, and now we're moving into the application development. What we've witnessed across the market is that people always need to be upskilling and reskilling themselves, which means that we need to move from, uh, I, would, I would use uh, Dr. Chris words here, from data centers to data centric, right? It's not about the, the brands anymore. It's not about the, the equipments anymore. It's about the value from the customer from one side and about the delivery, the service delivery ecosystem on a, on a bigger scale. So people would need to build more era of uh, integrations, APIs, integrations, knowledge. So this is the first thing to be able to deliver a solution. And the second thing would be uh, into opening up or tapping up, you know, uh, new eras to learn as well. So this is very important. We've, we've listening uh, today, we've, we've hearing across the market to uh, new terms of containers, right? When we speak IoT, when we, when we bring the compute to the edge nowadays, we need to understand the, 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 how you can deliver more of a container architecture, how you can deliver, modernize your applications, right? So if IDC, for example, saying that by 2025, we're gonna uh, hit more than 40 billion IoT devices, uh, you know, creating more than 75 zettabytes of data. So this is an untapped opportunity. This is, uh, I wouldn't say the new oil, it's the new oil since a while, but this is exactly where we need to tap in. So this is the, the first thing. And the second thing would be, you know, uh, deep skilling ourselves. We at Microsoft, we've, we've already started to align with a post-COVID kind of digital skilling for 25 million people globally. It's something listed on, on LinkedIn, also for contributors who can check out the portal and start from there. Thank you, Ahmed. And Chris, I want to throw something very similar to you, but it's actually about Edge. Last I heard, Edge was the guy who played guitar in U2, but we're going to be talking a lot more about Edge. And why is it so important? I thought everyone was happy throwing stuff in the cloud. Why should they bring it down and make it hang around your device? 
So look, it's very simple, Dave. I mean, by the way, we can help you with that phone issue. We have 5G phones, okay? Um, <laughs> look, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is a transformation. So how are we going to get all of this data and compute it at the edge? Okay, so all these new devices getting connected. As you've heard, between 10 is now going to grow to 75% of data is going to be generated and processed at the edge by 2025, okay? So what that means is infrastructure that traditionally sits in a data center is gonna to have to move to the edge. It goes back to Nalisha's point, it's got to be designed around security, okay? So you're taking enterprise class infrastructure and moving things like this. This is an edge device. It runs 5G, it runs LTE, 4G, okay? It's putting this at the edge, okay? So security in mind, if anyone tampers with it, it deletes the encryption keys of the customer's data inside. So it's building the security protocols inside and making sure we're designing with security in mind and also having the compute power, okay? So then back to the education then, it's important that we help our customers and help them understand how can they leverage this because there's a cost involved, but as I say on the back of it, there's a, there's a business opportunity as well. With that, looking at uh, the devices as well, you touched on it and I really want to get down to this. I worry about security, not least when you, if you send it up to the cloud, that's fine. Hopefully everyone will leave it alone. But when it's going to lots of different places, at every stage there's an opportunity to catch it and do stuff with it. Now, Saad, when you're looking at the infrastructure that you're putting together and you've got faster data centers and faster ways of creating relationships with the content and, and you're a big fan of gaming, I can see that. My wife won't let me do that because then apparently I don't talk to her for hours. Um, security is a big issue. How is that being addressed? Uh, that is true, Dave. Uh, just uh, I'd like to take a step back and continue from what uh, Dr. Chris mentioned by giving an example why why edge is important. Is uh, I'll take an example of YouTube and uh, Netflix. Uh, if you see the uh, operations and the data centers of YouTube and Netflix, they're outside the countries, at least in the MENA region. So what operators are doing are they are trying to bring caches and CDNs within the country to make sure that they have instead of utilizing the submarine cables, which are super expensive for so any, if I'm watching a movie, I, I wouldn't watch it from YouTube in the US or Europe as an example of data centers. I'll watch it from a cache that is being here hosted in Saudi. And it's because of multiple reasons. First is to lower the cost of the submarine and utilize it in a better way. Okay, the second part is to have a better experience. So instead of I wait, this is mostly around physics where the data will have to travel all those uh, all this i mean from here until the uh, whether it's the U us or europe and it will be traveling to uh, a data center that is nearby so it is going to be similar for operations and for companies so if we're taking an, as an example and i'm going to relate it to security if we're taking an industrial site where machines uh, cctvs they are all talking to each other and there are controls that are being happening and being done within that uh, facility, what's going to happen is that instead of sending it to the cloud and having this extra latency that is not required, as well as to make sure that everything is processed within the edge to make sure that this quality of experience is happening, as well as the security aspect, because uh, the one I mentioned around the slicing, and this is upcoming in 5G, where you can even slice the network, the radio itself, which is the wireless communication, you, have, you can have it dedicated for that purpose. So no one is actually interfering with you. It's like a, a totally physically isolated network and it's being processed in your premise. So this is something where everything is processed and this is like uh, uh, for the operational technology team that, is, that are, I mean, doing their work in uh, industrial sites, this is what exactly they're looking for. They don't want anyone to tamper with their network, network and they don't want to connect with any other network as well. And this is where 5G and edge computing in, is bringing this into reality. I can see that Nilesh wants to jump in on this. Nilesh, would you like to continue? Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's a great, great point about, uh, you know, from uh, ensuring the security in the network, uh, particularly in the, yeah, from STC perspective. I think the three things I would say quickly, um, from a security and a data perspective, if you're talking about data on the edge, uh, either on your phone, Dave, or anywhere else, 
the couple of things they're going to see more and more uh, as a critical part of the infrastructure. Encryption is going to be critical. Data at rest and data in transit has to be encrypted. But and I think you are going to also see a lot of vanilla claim about uh, end-to-end encryption. However, there is no guarantee that data before getting encrypted was not compromised. So, you know, the devices that you choose, I think Chris has given some examples in the past as well and other places. You want to make sure that the architecture you choose uh, allows you to have uh, encryption that is that can be trusted. Part of the encryption uh, and decryption capabilities also have demand on your compute horsepower. So in terms of end-to-end -end security infrastructure perspective, you want to make sure your choices of, of uh, infrastructure products are able to decrypt and encrypt that traffic in a very uh, specific way. And the third thing is the software stack you, uh, you deploy. Uh, for example, at Digital 14, we have our communication stack, messaging capabilities, and so on. The key management becomes a new differentiator. If I'm talking to you, Dave, how do I know it's you? The intelligent key management and on an ongoing basis, and somebody manning the middle attack would to come in and take away your keys. How do you protect from that? All those issues are going to be more critical nowadays. So I think in terms of going back to your question, how do you secure your data? Uh, at, at the edge or in the in the tra in transit, encryption and how you manage your keys, the whole PKI infrastructure, all that is going to be a critical design choices to ensure that you have a secure experience, even if, particularly in the 5G world as you transition to it. Thank you. If you just join us, by the way, welcome. You're a little bit late. We have got an incredible conference now, sharing about the it's en enabling intelligent transformation in a data-driven world. And you can see our incredible panel here. And we've got some great questions coming through. Tons of questions, and only limited space and time to get on with them. So, Ahmed, here's one for you. Um, this is from Natasha Williams. Natasha, thank you for sharing this question. Uh, what are the risks to data sovereignty when migrating to the cloud and SaaS, which is, of course, um, software as a service? Uh, thanks, Natasha. That's a brilliant question. So first of all, we start by assessing, you know, what are your security standards? So let me give you a very high level thing. So we've seen across the cloud deployment what we call the three Ps, right? So people are a little bit paranoid, like from a security perspective, we don't want to move to the cloud. Uh, you know, we're, we're having everything on premise, we're having everything, you know, to, to keep it on premise within our data centers. We've seen the other side of the shore, which is the Pollyanna, which are people like cloud for everything. And the best approach would be more of pragmatic, pragmatic approach to go to the cloud. Uh, the key word here for pragmatic approach is, you know, having, a, a, I would say, a hybrid cloud model, which means that you do assess your workloads or you do assess your applications, evaluate which ones are cloud friendly, which we're going to make use of a better cloud economics from a cost perspective, agility when it comes to uh, scaling up and scaling down your workloads accordingly. And then we're going to move them to the cloud. The second tier would be more sitting with, with a low latency, high sovereignty, uh, you know, high uh, data risks, I would say, from an organization perspective, from a compliance and governance perspective. And this where you can have your own uh, I would say cloud on-premise uh, hardware solutions. So uh, working with, with Lenovo, for example, and other uh, OEM providers, they do have a complete look and feel hardware for the cloud to be hosted on-premise. So you literally, as if you're buying your own public cloud, but you're deploying it on-premise. And this will tick all the boxes when it comes to your own uh, security governance and risks. And then you have a complete stack to manage this hybrid cloud with a single pane of glass as well. So you'll have the complete visibility for the full stack. So it's no more of a siloed approach, the old approach of having separate hardware silos and then a cloud deployment on its own. It's more of a data center, uh, I would say, a complete holistic 360 degree view. Building the hybrid cloud is the pragmatic approach across the three Ps. And it is the recommended one to keep your sovereignty from one angle and to make benefit of the cloud, uh, you know, fruitful economics and agility and things moving forward. 
Thank you, Ahmed. We've got another question here from Nanny Butty, or Booty, uh, and it's actually to Mr. Saud, who we've not asked a question to for a little while, so it's, it's your turn again. And it's all about the telecom sector. How do you manage to drive and enable digital transformation? And what can we expect? I mean, from the experience of the, of the post-pandemic world, we know how important telecoms are, um, but what are we going to yeah. see is a big change in that? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, how we drive uh, digital transformation uh, as STC is uh, we're taking an approach which is uh, a holistic approach and uh, coming back from the poll where all the above uh, is added I mean uh, or it, it, it has the highest I would say uh, uh, selection is that we have as STC uh, our one of our subsidiaries which is called STC solutions which is the uh, I would say the largest uh, system integration company in Saudi for the past four, four years. And we are taking it from end to end perspective. So there is the education piece, there is the SI piece. So it's, it's very difficult for us as telcos to come and put 5G and expect it to work and everyone will transform. So what we need to do is calculate the TCO or the total cost of ownership, convince the client, bring on board with us companies like Digital 14, Microsoft and Lenovo and lead this, I would say, a discussion with clients to make sure that this proposition would work and, ha and this proposition is controlled end to end because there are multiple aspects and you don't want any of those to go wrong, whether it's security, whether it's the hardware, whether it's the platform or the network itself. So ensuring the end to end journey and the use case as we call it is, uh, it's really viable from financially and technically. This is where we can start. And then we can start by uh, prototyping, proof of concepts, and moving towards making sure that this is commercially viable and uh, making it available to those customers. Chris, so that's did you want to approach. join in? Thank you, Saud. Chris, do you want to speak? Yeah, just that? an additional comment there to, to follow up from Saud. I mean, in, in their environment, at the end of the day, there's a cost to every telco on putting the 5G infrastructure out there. How are those costs going to be recouped? Okay, so you know Saud and his organisation and all the other telcos, they're looking at new business models and building new revenue streams to bring in the revenue to support those infrastructures and those solutions. So that's another important facet to take into account as well. Big question because right now everyone who's interested in it is kind of scared but really intrigued at the same time. Now Lenovo have a role, a huge role of bypassing legacy and people holding on to their own technology and making it so it's open and accessible, whatever your particular data plan and strategy would be. Um, is it a difficult role for Lenovo to look where things are going in the future and be a part of it? I wouldn't say it's a difficult role, it's a critical role. I mean, the, the, the key differentiator of Lenovo in the marketplace is that we try where possible to remain software agnostic. We, we don't own any proprietary, and that's important for customers. So the focus we have is on working very closely with end user customers to really understand the business challenges they're facing. Once we can understand the business challenges, because we don't have any legacy we have to support, we can then build the right solutions with our partners, you know, be it with STC, be it with Microsoft, be it with Nilesh and his organization, but we can actually build the right solutions that are fit for purpose for that customer scenario. So we're not, we're not held back and constrained due to your internal things that are legacy. Thanks, Chris. We lost a little bit of your answer in there. I think it's because of the, the technology, because we're not all on 5G yet. But when we are, that'll never happen again. Uh, we're, we're going short on time, so I want to be able to throw a question just across the board. And this is one that I think I'd like everyone to give their answer to, which is how do people get started and what's it going to cost? What, what kind of investment can they really make if they want to get started today? On, in case of staffing, in case of finances, in case of technology, and where should they start? So Chris, do you want to take this first? Sure. I mean, sim simply put, it's not a case of if, it's when, okay? We've already made it clear. Every organization has to go through a digital and therefore an intelligent transformation. It's, it's the only way to remain ahead of the curve and remain competitive in the, in the marketplace they're in. So the key thing first is, you know, even whilst 5G is not necessarily available everywhere today, there's new technologies that are available around Edge and IoT that really play an important part today. 
And that can give real differentiation to any organization. And I think that's an important facet here that all organizations need to look at that and leverage those new technologies and understand the business benefits that will give them in the competitive marketplace. And again, it all plays the digital transformation and those technologies are available today. And again, the focus really should be where possible, staying and maintaining on open standards, but keeping security as paramount in anything that you do. Thank you. Same question to Nilesh, where should we get started and what should we do? Yeah, no, I think, um, again, I'll, I'll try to simplify it to the points I started with, uh, which is, again, focus on the products that are secure by design, um, you know, at the solution level, uh, resilient end-to-end, -end, make sure that your architecture design is done uh, for resiliency at a, on a continuous basis, and be mindful of, uh, you know, uh, regulations and controlling your destiny whenever you need it. And all this stuff is done while keeping the mind in some of the critical technology elements that you need to design into your, uh, uh, your thinking around encryption, key management, and some of those capabilities used to be uh, parked at, at certain part of their, their, their data centers and islands. Now it, has, it will be your fabric end to end, your secure messaging fabric, your secure communication fabric, everything has to be secured. And the last one thing I'll say is identity. One of the key areas of design choices you need to keep in mind is ensuring the identity of your uh, communication uh, between between entities, between devices, and so on. And that's where I go back to the, the point about the so sort of the core technologies uh, has to be from a security perspective has to be part of it. Your CISOs needs to be part of your design uh, team, uh, not only your uh, IT infrastructure team. Uh, your OT infrastructure team will need to also include uh, CISOs and some of the security architects and so on. So it's really going to be a changing the way you go about solving your problems. Thank you, Nilesh. Ahmed, would you like to share on that? Where, where do we start and where do we go? Well, I would always say start with the business, right? Start with your own business. So let us, let us uh, you know, give it an insight here a little bit. If you're in the oil and gas business and you're able to unleash the value of what IoT can bring you and 5G into the picture from a, a huge vast amount of data or from bringing the compute to the edge and being able to uh, you know, bring value to the business, this is exactly where you need to start. Because if you were able to get the real value in terms of you know, productivity, in terms of revenue stream generation, in terms of even employee efficiency, like we've witnessed across this uh, pandemic, employees' productivity and efficiency. If you're able to witness these things in a clear objective, then start moving over, how can I achieve such a solution? And this were all all the, the panel here with their expertise, you know, when it comes to uh, Lenovo and their uh, data centers expertise, when it comes to, you know, um, we at Microsoft, when, uh, from a productivity and applications perspective, security perspective from, from uh, Nilesh and his team, and when it comes to the telco. So you got the, all the recipe, you just need to start from the business and then look at upskilling and reskilling again the people to be able to get a value out of it so it's not only about the technology investments it's about the people investments as well they run in parallel to make sure that you achieve those kpis where we started from at the beginning and that's it from my side i think this is the way to move forward there is a business potential for iot uh, 5G, of course, with the right uh, data protection scheme and the, the, the right onboarded list of uh, system integrators, partners, and vendors to be able for you to achieve, uh, you know, such an outcome or such a business revenue stream that you're currently not seeing. So, same question. You're at the sharp end of implementation. And so, so where do you recommend that people should start? Well, I would really second uh, what Ahmed mentioned is starting for the business. I know that maybe this is a bit of a more of a technical little bit uh, discussion. However, starting from what, the, what business are you in, where do you aspire to be, and uh, how to get there. So putting a roadmap of how do you want to achieve your business and transform your business in the future is, is key and it's important. And based on that, within this, this roadmap, you would really plug in what kind of technology is and the things that you need along the way. And of course, keep in mind always, there are what we call the no regret moves. 
just like, for example, uh, digital identity is required, security is required, uh, and, and artificial intelligence as an example. This is where you may need to invest to make sure that you are reaching towards the end goal that, that you're going to. Uh, at the end, I would like to say that it's, at the end, it's going to be disrupt or be disrupted. So you need, you need to make sure that you are really changing and you are evolving and transforming towards the best. Great questions and great answers. I'll take another question. We've got one here from Maxim Shurikov, who's saying our company is from a digital education or ed tech industry. So my questions are all about education. And that's really about the education of where we go. The skill sets, the mindsets are vital to get this to work. Otherwise, people are just going to stand back and see their competitors do better. Who would like to start with looking at the mindset and skill sets and how we move forward with that? Nilesh, you've got your mic open. You've always got your mic open. Would you like to start? No, I forgot to mute it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> since you teed me up, I'll just say it. But yeah, so I think, you know, obviously, ed tech and particularly the whole uh, information technology adoption uh, beyond Corp, remote classrooms, I think this is a, actually a, a great time to be in ed tech market. Uh, to be able to serving the more current crisis situation. But I think a lot of uh, what's going on will be norm. Uh, you know, all my, both my kids are now educating, getting educated remotely. Um, so I think comes comes with that also the responsibility of uh, making sure that the technologies are also evolving. Uh, I've come across a lot of uh, capabilities where folks are now using gesture control and so on to make the curriculum a lot more interesting. That will also drive a need for a different type of uh, uh, software and uh, you know, backend infrastructure to be able to do uh, those kind of capabilities to allow and make the uh, education exp experience a lot more immersive uh, based on gesture control and, and making sure the kids are paying attention or not and so on. The other part of the education ad tech is particularly in the professional world um, and particularly from the security perspective, I will just uh, stay focused on that for now. Uh, you know, up, up leveling your skills. Um, at Digital 14, we have a hack in the box training and so on. But in general, making sure that, uh, you know, your skills are getting up upgraded on a consistent basis. So those who are in the, uh, you know, ad tech business, there's a whole new area of uh, focus that needs to be applied. And there's huge growth opportunities around that as, uh, as well as you get into um, the next wave of transitions in, uh, in technology with edge and with 5G and so on. Dr. Chris, mindset, skill set. Skill set, change of mindset. You know, we discussed it earlier, you know, and, and you know, the point was raised very clearly by myself. Disrupt or be disrupted. It's a simple fact. We have to, okay? Go back to the, the analogy I use when we started this transition from three-tier architecture type conversion. It was a change in mindset not just the changing technology. Think about this, 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 this call we're having today. You know, I wish we could do a poll and put hands up, all of you, in the first two months of the pandemic, we're going crazy and getting fed up at the fact that you were working so many hours, all hours, early morning, late at night, on calls. You know, hopefully for Microsoft, but like us, it was Teams calls, okay? Maybe it was Zoom. But the fact is, it's about a change in mindset. As we've evolved through the last few months, I think we've all understood that there's tremendous value we can get from this. You know, turning this into rather than an hour's presentation, we turn it into a 10 minute presentation and then a dialogue like this. So there's incredible value and education that can be used using the tools that we have in our hands today. And we all just need to understand it. Send that question to Ahmed. So I believe upskilling, reskilling is the key word, right? When we speak about education, looking back, if we don't learn from the past, we wouldn't be you know, predicting the future. So look what our kids are learning today. How are they learning today? How are they you know, attending the, the classrooms, attending exams, you know, uh, even socializing, reading books, accessing the libraries. So it's getting all digital. You know, this is the this is the future. So if you're in the education education business yourself as a system integrator, you're being lucky because you're untapping a, a huge opportunity of you know content uh, management system, learning and education systems, all of those online. Sooner or later, agree or disagree, you know you're gonna have to 
go digital. You don't have any other, uh, you know, work around around this. At least for the meanwhile, at least for the current economy. And also, I'll, I'll echo um, uh, Saud here on saying disrupt or be disrupted. So you know. Uh, take it or leave it kind of thing. This is very important for us. So this is one side. The other side is remember the shift you've made your mindset moving forward, as, as uh, Chris was saying, moving forward from the old Nokia phones, the old analog phones into a smartphone, right? So you build the mindset that this, these kind of devices is the future and you need to know how to use it. You need to familiarize yourself with it. You started getting into the, the app stores and downloading apps and familiarizing and building your uh, you know, knowledge forward. So it's still, there is a mindset there. There is a persistence, there is a mindset. So summarizing it up, if you're in the technology uh, educational sector, you're in the lucky uh, you know, uh, business trend right now in the, in the hot selling cakes, we would say, bring this discussion forward, go and offer, digitize whatever you can for your you know, um, organizations. And from a, from a continuous learning perspective, this is how tech is being driven. So if you're not continuously upgrading yourself, you'll be left out somehow within the, within the path. Chris Cooper from Lenovo. There are trade-offs though in this, isn't there? This trade-off between using a data center architecture and going more mobile. Um, what are the pitfalls? What are the challenges? What should people think about? Because it's going to involve cybersecurity and privacy when you make those trade-offs as well. What do Lenovo suggest about that? It's a very open-ended question, Dave. But I mean, again, you know, we, we've reiterated the point there. Security is paramount, okay? So you can build, you know, security by design, as Nilesh pointed out. You can build security into edge computing devices. That's one thing you can do. Um, but there's, there's much more that we need to look at here. We need to look at the benefit this delivers. The benefit this delivers in that, take a traditional data center, you don't have, and as Saud has pointed out, the cost of the, and the challenges of latency and bandwidth of bringing in all these new data streams and translating that into a data center to make an informed decision. If you've got an autonomous vehicle, you're coming up to a traffic light, you don't want to be linking out to a cloud system to say, should I brake? Should I accelerate? You need that compute, that informed decision made locally. So it's important that we understand how that technology evolves, where it has a place, make sure the security is built into it and build that as the foundation. I mean, Ahmed, I think, is belittling himself there with Microsoft. They're already delivering edge solutions. So as we're all aware, you know, particularly during the pandemic, there's been a massive increase in cloud computing and the utilization of the hyperscalers, okay? Their business is going through the roof because it's easier to take those workloads and outsource them than it has been for people to access and get kit delivered and, and build their own systems in-house. That's one aspect of it, but at the same time, they're now taking that solution to the edge. So Microsoft have their own Microsoft Azure offering at the edge, again, built on similar technology to what I show, showcased earlier. So the technology is there. It's about involving and making sure we fit them into the right applications. Thank you. Prediction time and time scale. How long do you think it's going to be before this whole conversation is going to look like an old archived conversation? When are we going to see it? So everyone's embracing 5G. They've got their edge computing. They're choosing which of the clouds they want to play with. How long is it going to be before implementation takes us to a new level? Anybody want to take that one first? And I'll hold you to it. <laughs> Ahmed. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't predict something on, on behalf of, I'll give my personal opinion as a start, just not on, on behalf of, you know, uh, Microsoft. But whenever we, we learn from the past again, to predict for the future, we always see the technology trends takes almost 15 to 20 years of maturity, right? So 10 to 15 years, maximum of 20 years, it becomes the new norm. So looking back, for example, for the cloud computing started 2005, now we're at 2020, everybody knows about it. Yeah, it's, it's become more of uh, uh, not only a techie discussion. So started 2005 by 20, from 2005 to 2010, the early five years would be the early adapters, the risk takers, the people who are willing to put the sweat and effort to make this, you know, uh, 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 deployments and, and getting things up and running. And then we get 
the major shift within the rest of the you know status quo and then we come always there is always the people that who are lazy you know coming showing up late coming into you know trying to get into the last uh, bus before you know the, the departure so from a technology trend i'll see maybe in the next with if if we're talking let's say five to 10 years from now and we're speaking uh, about 5g and iot we already been uh, you know uh, familiar with it the, the last thing I want to mention, if you think that IoT is new to you, you need to think twice again. Why? Because a smartwatch simply is an IoT device, right? It, it's it becoming more of an internet connected device. So we're not only interne internet of things, we're internet of people right now. So we're moving at a faster pace than you think. A smartwatch, a wearable, uh, one of those, uh, you know, fitness trackers, the first ATM who already connected in the early 70s to an internet was considered an IoT device at that stage. So yes, the, the technology is reshaping, yet from um, uh, an IoT device, we're, we're already using them, we're familiar with them, so this is not something new to you. It's coming to the industries with a bigger revenue and a bigger scope and a bigger scale. So that's it. Neil, as you can see, you jumping in there. Your predictions, sir. When are we going to find that everybody is just old conversation about what we're sharing today? I think uh, there is a, a conflicting uh, play going on right now. On one hand, I think uh, the pandemic and everything we are doing right now is going to accelerate some of the trends and technologies that we are driving. So I believe, I think, uh, if nothing else, I think we do believe that uh, some of the you know, what Saud and others are talking about, so the 5G and edge technology will accelerate quickly, much faster than it was previously predicted. And I think uh, in next couple of years, you should start seeing much more um, uh, specific use cases around 5G technologies coming out, uh, healthcare, a lot of vertical focus one. The other com completing part of it is that the same people that are using to make the world better are also, uh, there are some people out there are using the same technology to hurt the world. Uh, and so the trust in those technologies and the solutions is going to be equally important. So uh, I think they all have to go in hand in hand in tandem. But I think the uh, one thing I would say is whatever prediction everybody had make, made before is going to be accelerated by at least uh, you know two x now with uh, what we are just going through in 2020. Thank you, Saad. When do you predict that we get? Well, you're in, implementing it. When are we all going to be talking as those old hats? Yeah. So uh, an STC, we are one of the early adopters and implementers of 5G, where we started in the first wave. And uh, our start strategy is to be a, a market maker, not a market follower. So, you know, it's, it's usually a chicken and egg situation where the, the net, does the network comes first or the devices come first. So we decided to build the network to be ready immediately for any upcoming use case. So... When it comes to timeline, I would expect that uh, within the next, uh, I would say, up to five years, we'll see a huge pickup. I agree with Nelash when it comes to edge. Uh, however, the early adoption is not similar to consumers. We'll see early adopters from business side based on verticals, based on the need, because it it's all depends on the business. If it makes a business sense, it will save uh, either make better efficiency or saving costs. Uh, this is where the use case will pick up quickly and they will sometimes overlook some of the constraints or the challenges because they, they want to make sure that they get the business benefit out of it. And then there are industries that will follow and they will be laggers because of the, there is no need for, for example, low latency or this big data jump or whatever. So it's going to be depend until it becomes, as mentioned by fellow panelists, uh, as uh, the norm. So we would see it without feeling it. Just like Ahmed mentioned, there's a watch and you would not think that this is an IoT device. It's just a smart watch. At the end, you will have something. You'd, you wouldn't think that this is an edge device, but it is an edge device. So this is at least from our, my perspective. Final words from Dr. Chris Cooper from Lenovo. Again, everyone said this, but it's gonna be sooner than we expect. Okay, take the analogy I use with 3G. Really, when that technology came to market, in my personal opinion, it was a technology that was looking for a marketplace. We now have a marketplace that demands and requires that technology. That's the key differentiation. And I think the key touch point is, as soon as end users get a touch and feel of what these new technologies can do, they won't want to look back. I think that's the difference, Dave. 
you know, this is all going to help in the acceleration of digital intelligent transformation, Steve. And with that, um, you've been watching an incredible panel sharing with you the insights behind the curtain on where things are going to be going in the future. I've got to thank every single one of them for their time. First of all, thanks to Dr. Chris Cooper from Lenovo, uh, Saeed Al Sarahi from SDC, Nilesh Patel from Digital 14, and Ahmed El Sahab, I hope I got that right, from Microsoft. Um, we look forward to these conversations continuing and of course more Jitex webinars powered and brought to you by Lenovo. Meanwhile, if we don't see you again for a while, we will see you on the big stages as we go live because events are back. Put this in your calendar, it's not there already. Jitex, 6 to the 10th of December at the Dubai World Trade Center. We're back and we're bringing blockchain. So whatever you've got planned, make sure you have a wonderful day and an incredible weekend. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure spending quality time with you. And thanks so much to the team, especially to Oscar and everybody else for making this a thing. So look after yourself and we look forward to seeing you in a digital world. Thank you for some great questions. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone.